Okay, hi all, I'm uh, TJ Tasik. Um, I'm a graduating senior with a double major in computer science and chemistry, and I work with Diane Pazeski on the analysis and QSAR modeling of human intestinal transporter database. And the purpose of my research really comes down to pharmaceuticals. The pharmaceutical industry is a more than trillion dollar industry, and we have three of the five largest pharmaceutical companies with presences here in the research triangle area. In drug discovery, is immensely costly. It estimates are at $2 billion in as much as 15 years to bring a new drug from nothing to market. Why? Well, part of that is drug resistance. You can make a drug that works perfectly in the lab, but if it's not absorbed into the body, it ain't gonna do squat. So, uh, drug resistance is mediated by cells in your intestine. And on the membrane of these cells are transporters, and they are what control what drugs are brought into the cells and into the body. And they exist both on the intestinal side and the bloodstream side. So our goal is to make drugs that are imported into the cell and exported into the bloodstream. Now, transporters are proteins that have an active site that bind selectively to different compounds. Um, compounds that are bound and transported across are called substrates. And it's polyspecific, so it will bind to different kinds of uh, compounds. And some compounds actually act as inhibitors, which will get stuck and clog the protein from transporting other substrates. So our goal is to build drugs that interact with the transporters in a way that we want. And if they look like this, it'd be easy. We'd say, let's build drugs that look like Mickey Mouse heads. But unfortunately, they don't. Uh, transporters look something like this, but it gets even more complex when you get down to the atomic level. So trying to model the selective, uh, the active site or the mechanism of selectivity of the proteins themselves is extremely difficult and not something that we're really prepared to handle. So instead, chem informaticians are looking at modeling the substrates themselves. And we're able to do that for two reasons. One is the structure activity relationship theory, which basically says that the behavior of chemicals is a function of its structure, and also the fact that chemistry is becoming a big data problem. The combination of combinatorial chemistry, which allows chemists to synthesize lots of chemicals all at once, and high throughput screening, which allows chemists to test lots of chemicals at once, are allowing them to collect data at rates hundreds of thousands of times faster than they could 30 years ago. So you might have in your mind that this is a machine learning problem. And that's true. Uh, so uh, machine learning has two major components, representation and generalization. So we can represent our compounds uh, in a computer using a unique identifier like a common name or an index number. Or we can represent them by their structure. We can use uh, graph representations. But keep in mind that chemicals are really three-dimensional orientations of infinitesimal points of mass and charge associated by infinite fields of electron density. So when you bring it down to a series of nodes and edges, you lose a lot of the pertinent information. So what we generally use are calculated descriptors, which are generated from the structure and capture the salient uh, aspects of the compound. Uh, descriptor sets generally range from those that are simple, like the number of atoms to, uh, and the number of rotatable bonds and the molecular weight of a compound to more esoteric measures like uh, the Cure 3 shape index, which is a measure of the branching factors of the compound. Like I said, the other half was generalization, which is the application of what we've learned from the compounds that we know the activities uh, to new compounds so that we can predict how they'll interact with transporters. And to do that, we use quantitative structure activity relationship modeling. The workflow for that is uh, we take a data set of compounds, we generate the descriptors, and then we split that data set into a modeling set and an external validation set. Then we take the modeling set, uh, bag it into multiple training sets and test sets, use any number of supervised machine learning uh, techniques to create models on the, mod uh, the training sets, test them on the test sets, take the best ones from that, combine them into an ensemble predictor, predict the activities of the external validation set, and the accuracy of that process gives us a measure of how good the predictor is. 
And then we also like to use that predictor and identify new compounds that we don't know the activities for in large databases uh, that are available, and then testing those chemicals uh, in the laboratory. So for my research, I used a database uh, that consisted of 56 data sets concerned with the interaction of 14 transporters and almost 4,000 chemicals, and there were over 10,000 activity values in all. The data sets were separated into those that were looking at the substrate activity of the transporters and the uh, inhibition activity of the transporters, and also those that had continuous values of how good they were at uh, being substrates or inhibitors, and also classification data sets, which basically just divided the different compounds into those that were inhibitors or not, and those that were substrates or not. I also characterized different data sets. So I looked at the number of compounds that were for each data set, and I calculated a modelability index, and I looked at the number of descriptors that were uh, retained for each data set. I also characterized the individual transporters that were represented by the data sets. So I looked at their location, whether they were on the bloodstream side, which is the basal side, or the uh, luminal side, which is also the apical side, and whether they were importers to the cell or exporters. And I also looked at their homology group, which is their family of related trans uh, proteins. The modelability index I mentioned is a heuristic proposed by the members of the Molecular Modeling Lab, which is a group in the School of Pharmacy here. For use, uh, it's a heuristic used to determine if a data set can be used to make a useful predictor. And it basically looks at the number of activity cliffs among the first nearest neighbors in the data set. So if uh, this in this toy example, the pink arrows show the activity cliffs for nearest neighbors. Those uh, two closest compounds that have different activities. As part of this research, I also developed and uh, proposed a uh, modelability index for data sets including continuous uh, activity values, which is basically a the average number of standard deviations between first nearest neighbors. So it's a similar measure to their classification modelability index. For my modeling, uh, I used Dragonate descriptors, which is a licensed set of about 2,500 descriptors. And I also used the CDK descriptor set, which is open source, and it's a subset of the Dragon descriptors. I used random forest techniques and uh, support vector machines and k-nearest neighbors that were tuned using either genetic algorithm or simulated annealing to build my predictors. So um, I plotted the predictive power of the data sets versus different uh, characteristics that I determined. And I found that, not surprisingly, the size of the data set had a positive, significant correlation with the predictive power of the data set. That's not surprising because the more compounds you have, the more data you have, the more you can learn, and the better your pr uh, predictor ought to be. Um, I also indicate the uh, modeling technique uh, by color. So random forest is green, SVM is blue, and KNN is orange. And the descriptor type, where CDK is circle and dragon is triangle. And I also indicate whether uh, auto scaling was used on the descriptors by a black border. And none of these things had a significant effect on the predictive power. I also found that the modelability index, both the one that they proposed for classification data sets and the one that I developed for uh, continuous data sets were both good heuristics for determining the predictive power of a data set. Um, again, the modeling type and descriptor set are denoted on these graphs, and when controlling for the modelability index, they still had no significant effect. However, the homology group of the transporters did have a significant effect, even when controlling for the modelability index, which implies some molecular basis uh, for why we're able to create predictors that's different from just uh, the distribution of the compounds in the descriptor space. Uh, specifically, the uh, ATP binding to set transporters, which are the ones that are shown in blue on the bottom graph, uh, were modeled more poorly than the solute carrier group, which is all the other colors. 
Um, and so it's possible that this discrepancy is due to the interaction of, or the use of the ATP molecule, uh, which is used by the uh, ATP binding cassette transporters uh, to power the transport of the substrate. And this is interesting, and it may uh, suggest a need for future work in the laboratory actually looking at these proteins themselves. Uh, in conclusion, I found that the size of the data set was significant. That's not very surprising. The modelability index was also a good heuristic, and the homology was good. Um, I also found that the algorithm was not significant, which means that uh, random forest was much faster, and I would recommend using that. And the descriptotype was not significant. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, some data sets are not easily modelable, and uh, some it, people will spend a lot of time trying to create models on data sets that aren't actually useful. So this is a very quick uh, heuristic that you can uh, calculate, uh, which is supposed to be able to tell you if the data set can even make useful predictors. Um, does that answer your question? It's just a heuristic. Right. Um, there are certainly similarity measures that uh, have been developed for different chemical compounds. Um, I didn't include that measure in my research, but they do exist. Certainly, um, and like that's what the Tenemoto uh, similarity measure captures. Uh, it looks at different functional groups and the size of the compounds, and I'm not really sure about the particulars for how it calculates the similarity measure, though. Uh, 